Good evening, everybody. My name is Todd Scholl. I'm the lead learner at the, the SCEA Center for Educator Wellness and Learning. Um, for those of you tuning in tonight to see Gary Weber uh, on the session Happiness Beyond Thought, unfortunately, he uh, was unable to, to make it tonight, but we are going to do our best to reschedule him. That just happens sometimes uh, with these virtual sessions. But I did want to um, just talk with you a little bit tonight, um, share some thoughts and ideas. First of all, I want to um, talk to you about um, the voucher bill that's up, the S Senate Bill 39. I know some of you have already heard about this and are aware of this. And um, you can make your voice be heard on this issue if you go to the SCEA.org S39. Now, here's what's happening. Essentially, what they want to do is spend millions of dollars to give vouchers or like a gift card or a gift certificate to people who want to send their children to private schools. I think most people don't have an issue if a person decides that the private school is the right choice for their family, for their child, and that's what they want to do. And, and they want to pay the tuition and deal with whatever the rules and parameters are of that private school. I think most people understand, uh, don't object to that. I think what the problem is, is that should we be spending public, should the public taxpayer be paying for someone to choose that private school? That's the issue. Should 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 our public tax dollars go to private a private um, school, especially when that private school is not going to be held accountable by the public? In other words, we're not going to really have any oversight over what happens in the school. Um, the school would be um, able to deny admittance to students with disabilities or to students who don't comply with their religious values. Um, they essentially would do an interview or the other thing that could happen is <clears throat> the tuition may be twice as much as a person can afford. So the idea was the idea that, uh, proponents of vouchers are saying is that this will help students in poverty, those families be able to afford a private option. And the problem with that notion is that private school tuition is typically much more than the voucher allows for. Plus, the voucher that the, the private school can discriminate. Plus, there's again no oversight. And then also, they're not required to provide any transportation. So, for young, a young family who maybe wants to send their kids to a private school but lives 30 miles away and can't get their child to and from school every day, that's not really an option for those people. They're also not required to provide free or reduced lunches as well. So, there are a lot of a lot of issues with this. The main thing I think that's simple and understand and, and and something that everybody can understand is that if there's no oversight by the public, why would we want to give public tax dollars to something that where, where the public doesn't have a say in, in holding that entity accountable for the money that we're spending? So the analogy that I've used is imagine if I would typically get my books at the public library and I go to my local library, I get a library card to check it out. I have to bring it back by a certain due date or I have to pay fines. Um, there's a, a selection, but maybe the book that I want isn't in. So say the book I want, I want to read uh, a Hemingway book or Steinbeck's uh, Grapes of Wrath and it's not in at my local library. So then I decide, okay, I'm going to go and I'm going to buy it at Barnes and Noble. Should money come out of the public library's budget for me to go and get Grapes of Wrath? I mean, that wouldn't make any sense, right? It wouldn't make sense for you, the taxpayer in South Carolina, to give me a gift card to Barnes to go buy a book at a private bookseller, um, and especially when there's no accountability about what I would buy with that um, gift card or gift certificate. Imagine if I just said, well, I want to just give away $50 gift cards to everybody and I want it to come out of your public tax dollars so that they can go spend money at a Barnes and Noble or a Books a Million. And oh, by the way, they can buy whatever they want when, and you'll have no say in it. So they could buy Grapes of Wrath or a classic novel or they could buy a magazine or they could buy a Bible or they could buy, you know, a brownie at the, or a coffee. I mean, when there's no accountability over what you're spending the money on, then that's kind of like flies in the face of what we traditionally think of in terms of what we earmark our um, our public tax dollars to on. We want to be able to say, 
look, is this is this effective? Is is this an effective use of tax dollars? Right. So if you're interested in voicing your concern about that, it seems very common sense to me. And by the way, if the notion is we were trying to improve um, education for students, if that's the argument, there's literally no data that I can find to suggest that vouchers improve outcomes for young people. There's just not, I haven't seen that data to suggest that. So in my mind, we would be better off instead of spending millions of new tax dollars on these vouchers, take those millions and invest them into our public schools, invest them into raises for teachers to provide better working conditions, to hire more uh, folks into the profession, to um, ensure that um, areas where the tax base may, may not be as strong as another place where we can uh, help that community in terms of school, the, the building new schools, um, technology resources, um, and whatever else they need to um, provide an excellent atmosphere for their students. It seems like that would be a much better use is to invest it into public schools because we actually have oversight and we can hold those schools accountable. Right? I mean, that that just makes sense. The, the public tax dollars should go to public schools, just like a public tax dollars should go to a public library and not a Barnes and Noble. It just seems obvious, right? To me, I mean, I don't, I don't see how that's controversial, but please, again, it, um, at the link on the screen right there, simple, the SEEA.org slash S39, it takes literally one or two minutes of your time. You can go there and you can voice your concern about this bill. We are going to continue to fight it. We're not going to compromise on this. It, uh, at this point, we, what we need to do is fight against it as hard as we can because we have to protect the institution of public schools. I want to thank Emily, who is tuning in, and Bessie, who's tuning in, and Keneal, who's tuning in. Hi, hi, Emily, Bessie, and Keneal. Um, absolutely. Um, Keneal says, over 95% of our students in South Carolina are in public schools, so let's put public funds into our public schools, Right. And she shared the uh, link again. Uh, if you are on Facebook, you can just click her the link that she uh, just put there. So the SEEA.org slash S39. And so, okay. And Emily, hi, how you doing? And Kay, how are you doing? So good, good to see you guys tuning in. Appreciate everybody uh, checking out the live stream tonight. And again, uh, our our guest is was unable to show up tonight. So it's just me and I'm going to be talking for a little bit. I want to talk a little bit about the importance of truth. So the other thing the SCEA has been fighting for is to ensure that educators feel a sense of freedom to talk about the truth of American history. Well, the truth of American history is that there's a lot of great things that have happened. You know, we've sent, sent folks to the moon. We've, um, you know, we helped promote democracy. We've, you know, fought, help, fought, fight, and defeat Nazis. I mean, it's there's a lot of great things that we can look at throughout American history that we can point to and say that's something that we should be proud of. But there are also at, um, points in American history where we've made horrific mistakes. Where, as as a species, as hu as human beings, we've done horrible things to other human beings, and. That is not something that we need to hide or to pretend didn't happen. It's something that we actually really need to explore deeply about how it happened, what exactly happened, why, you know, why did it happen, and then help the next generation see that this is a mistake we never want to repeat again. It makes sense, right? We want to look at all of it. So we want to be able to read books and read about the history, read about the successes, read about the mistakes, read about the failures um, that we've had. And this isn't, and you don't read about the mistakes and failures because you don't love America, or you're anti American, or you're, and you don't read about, uh, say, uh, slavery um, or the Holocaust because you hate German people or you hate white people. That's, that's, not what we're, that's not what it's trying to promote. It's trying to just look, take an honest examination of what has really occurred throughout history. And that's, that I used to not be controversial, I don't think, to, to actually look at the, at the reality of, of human history and the wide breadth of human experience. So in, 
in our libraries as we study and bring young people along. The other thing that's really important is that we have books that represent a wide variety of backgrounds and viewpoints. So a student should be able to go into the library and find books with protagonists that look like them or that are, are like them in a variety of ways, whether that's an LGBTQ character or, or um, Latinx character or a, uh, 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 an African-American character or a white character or female characters. We should have a variety of books available, right? And we should have a variety of viewpoints available. The problem is that what's happening now is there's this strain of intolerance that's running rampant throughout um, American culture where if someone finds a book offensive or, or like if you don't think any student should be reading a book with a, a gay protagonist, then you think that that book should be banned for everybody. You have a right as a person to say, I don't want to read that book. Or I'd prefer my child not to read that book. What you don't have a right to do is to force that particular viewpoint on other people. I personally want my kids to read a diverse um, set of books because they're going to have to go out to the real world with a diverse set of people and get along with them and work with them and problem solve with them and collaborate with them. I want my, my, young, my kids to think about life from different perspectives. I want them to know everything about hum, uh, our history as uh, uh, not just American history, but world history. I want them to know, you know, what's happened. Um, if that makes, if history, studying history or studying the reality of the world makes you uncomfortable, maybe that's kind of a good thing. It's not about generating, just generating guilt, but it's about gen maybe generating some feelings of discomfort because sometimes when we get out of our comfort zone, that's where our greatest growth can be. I remember first learning about the civil rights movement when I was a young child and learning about racism and the Ku Klux Klan and all of that stuff. And I just was shattered by that. I remember being very young and being just shattered by that and being really upset that people were treated like that. And that helped me wake up um, to the fact that I, as a, a white person, don't have to, I haven't didn't have to deal with that and I haven't had to deal with that throughout my life experience and that was really valuable to me it's an important it was an important part of how I grew up and became uh, better informed about how to navigate the world and to understand that there are other people that were living an experience different than my own because they had a different skin color or because they were a different religion or because they had a different sexual orientation or different different gender identity and ex being exposed to that and learning about that helps build empathy, helps build compassion, helps build understanding, helps build peace. And that's what we want to create, I would think. I, just, I don't understand why it's controversial. I, it doesn't make sense. So we have to fight back against this culture of fear. There's this, this, this burgeoning culture of fear. And, um, and I, I've heard reports from folks here in South Carolina who um, have had their uh, email uh, under scrutiny from FOIA requests. So there are people that are submitting FOIA requests targeting specific teachers that they know maybe on Facebook have posted something political or posted something that they don't like that they don't agree with. So then they go to the school district, submit a FOIA request to get all of those emails and they do search terms. So then you may do a search term like moms for liberty or censorship or diversity or LGBTQ or whatever. And then they're, they're asking not only for their emails, but their deleted emails as well. And so what happens is this creates an incredible atmosphere of tension and fear. And you see what's happened in Florida where Educators now are very much scared because there's a law that if you have the wrong type of book in your classroom library, that that can be considered a felony. Not just like a slap on the wrist, say, hey, you know, remove that book, but that you can be arrested for a felony for having the wrong books. That to me should set off alarm bells for all of us because in, 
because the educators I know, they want to have a diverse set of books in their classroom library because they have a diverse set of students and they want to make sure that they have a wide variety of books available to the students. And now they're scared because the way these laws are set up can be so nebulous and can be interpreted in such ways. And then you have these outside groups coming in and doing these FOIA requests and putting on, on all this kind of pressure that they're just like, say, forget it. I'll just get rid of all my books. I'll just put all my books away and not even have any books available. And that to me is such a shame because it's creating this culture of fear. It's creating this, this censorship dynamic where educators who are well-intentioned now are just afraid. That is coming to South Carolina. In fact, it's already come to South Carolina. I've talked, have had several teachers break down in front of me talking about how materials that they've used for 20 years and had no issues with, no problems, things that you've used to teach um, foreshadowing, for example, are now under scrutiny and they've been told they're not allowed to use those materials anymore. And these are highly trained, highly competent professionals who've used these materials for years. And now they are no longer able to feel that sense of freedom and autonomy. And this is creating a dynamic that I think is driving good teachers out of the profession. And that is really, to me, a shame because, and, and, and really, it, it's also preventing us from recruiting people because people, young people see that and don't want to go into that kind of uh, environment of fear and, um, and restriction. So we want to fight back against that, against these laws that are designed to censor teachers, to prevent the full teaching of truth, to force other people's moral values and political values on into the classroom, to insert those and to start to discriminate against uh, uh, certain materials based upon their own religious or political values. If you're um, if this concerns you, you can see the link that Keneal's provided there. It's the SCEA.org slash pro-truth. Please may let your voice be heard. Please. Two really important issues. Because what, what underlies both of these issues is there, there are forces that want to dismantle public education. And there's a whole lot of reasons why. One of the reasons is that they see an opportunity here to make money, right? To take the money that would go to um, public schools and have them go to private for-profit entities, whether it's a school, private school or uh, corporations that run private schools or run charter schools, run private charter schools. Um, and so they see an opportunity for money to be made here, right? The other thing that's driving this is there are people who see schools as godless simply because they took prayer out of school and they're no longer like Christian dominated, right? So schools used to have prayer, used to have be more Christian dominated. And then we decided as a, as a uh, society that has a lot of different religious, uh, has a lot of people with a variety of religious views, we decided that we wanted to make it a neutral place where no matter what your religious views, you could feel comfortable going to your public school. Right. And some people see that as a problem and they want they want their way um, forced back into the public arena and they don't want their tax dollars to go to something that they feel is, quote unquote, godless or whatever. That's problematic. Right. Um, so uh, we have to defend the institution of public schools. We have to defend um, the right for every young person to be able to get up and go to a high quality public school with high quality educators and receive a high quality education so that they can make the most of their lives. So let's get some comments in here. Keneal says, that's right. All students are welcome in our schools. Those children deserve to see themselves reflected in their educational experience, right? So the public school doesn't get to discriminate, right? The public school, you, you come to that public school, we're going to, you have a disability, you have, you have a, you're a, if you're, um, a multi-language learner, uh, uh, you're bilingual, whatever, or if you are gay or if you're transgender, um, if you have behavioral difficulties, whatever, whatever, we, you come in. 
we don't we don't tell you no nah, you didn't quite make the, you know we have a we have criteria here and you don't get to come here that's not how it works with public schools we take in everybody that's why public tax dollars go to public schools is because we do we take everybody and we serve everybody private schools don't do that private schools don't do that Camille also said USA is a, a melting pot for uh, refugees uh, from from dictatorships that's right and so and very we should be very proud of that those of us who work in public schools know see and understand the value of public schools um, it is it is a to serve in a public school as and i did for over 15 years was an honor to be able to to be given the trust of working with young people is, is an honor and 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 educators deserve to be honored and treated uh, nobly and deserve to be treated with such higher levels of respect and that happens in other countries and for some reason in our country we've seen a devolution in in the way we treat our educators we no longer trust them we no longer treat them with respect there's all kinds of narratives that are forced upon them that are destructive um, they're they're called marxist indoctrinators we have folks in leadership positions and education leadership positions who are charging educators with indoctrinating. We've heard politicians running for office recently talk about that they're going to end this Marxist indoctrination of our students. And anybody who's in a public school, like I, I go around this entire state. I've been in almost every district in South Carolina. I've talked to educators from all over, and I haven't met one of them who is trying to indoctrinate students into Marxism. What's happening is there's a conflation everywhere and it's, and it's a conflation designed. There's conflation happening a lot of places with critical race theory, with Marxism, there's a conflation. So they'll conflate, for example, any anytime you talk about diversity or equity, that that's, that's somehow um, critical race theory, which is not. Or if you happen to talk about, equity, they can charge you with Marxism, even though that's not really what Marxism <laughs> is. So it is, um, we are, we are in a uh, really perilous time right now. And the forces aligned against public schools are strong. They have a lot of money. They have a lot of power. And they're very, very adept at utilizing language, utilizing rhetoric and propaganda to convince enough of the public to, to make these changes, to support vouchers, to, su to suppress the truth, right? If we care about protecting public schools, I know of no better way to do that than to come together under one union with one voice. And that's why we are promoting this idea of one union, one voice, and yes, union. The NEA is a union, and the South Carolina Education Association is an affiliate of the NEA. And we're proudly a union. Union is where we can come together and build collective power to fight back and defend public schools. And it's not just about these voucher bills, and it's not just about uh, the censorship bill, because that it, we could get those solved, and other things are going to come up. There's going to be a continued assault. But it's also about, you know, the wages that our educators are paid. They've they've been stagnant for so long. While we've seen inflation go up, we have seen um, the wages of educators barely, barely uh, increase. We see working conditions deteriorate. You know, I haven't been in the classroom in a while, and when I go back and I talk to educators, folks that I taught with, and they tell me how things have changed. And how, how much worse it's, in fact, I just had this conversation last night with somebody said how much worse it's gotten over the past five to 10 years, because more and more is being asked of educators and they still have the same amount of time to, to, to get all of that done. And more, more, more of their planning time is being taken up and it's really, really frustrating um, for those educators. And so many of them that I talked to that are close to the end of their career, are like, I cannot wait till I get till I'm able to retire. And some folks are looking to retire early. And there's even teachers that I've talked to are like, I don't know if I can make it to 
to retirement because of the conditions that I'm facing. And Keneal's exactly right. The Senate bill, the voucher bill 39, um, will take $90 million from taxpayers and essentially be a gift certificate for private schools. And the thing is, this is just the beginning. The $90 million is just the beginning. This is not where they want to, this is not their end point. This is not their end game to just do $90 million worth of, of, of vouchers. This is the beginning. Then they're going to build on it and build on it and build on it. And they're, they're going to keep pressing this. And eventually what it's going to do is gut the public school, right? Because let's just say they're successful in getting people, more and more young people to go to private schools. Then they're going to have an excuse to start gutting the budgets of public schools. So all you have to do, you don't have to be like a master chess player to see the, the, the movements that are taking place. Their end game is the destruction of public education. That's, that's them. That's the checkmate they're looking for. They want to end it. They know that they can't go in and just say, okay, we're ending public schools right now. So they have to put the pieces in place one at a time to make that happen. So let's go back and talk about the first thing that they did, which was after a nation at risk came out in the Reagan administration, they, they, essentially promoted the idea that public schools were failing, that public schools um, and, and particularly um, teachers unions were failing American students, that we were falling behind the rest of the world. What this allowed them to do is it convinced enough of the public to say that, okay, well now we've got to come up with some type of accountability system. So they essentially started this obsession with standardized testing. Right, because this all goes back to PISA scores and 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 how we compare to our international competitors. So they started to laser focus on the fact on on testing scores, and uh, and attached and tied uh, money to testing. So increasingly, testing became the god that you know schools served. And, and not because educators thought that was the right thing to do, but because that's what politicians forced upon, is a system that was forced upon educators. Because they no longer, they, they, they built a sense of distrust around educators. They built a sense of distrust around the whole public education system and said, the public has to hold those schools accountable. And the only way we can do that is through, um, you know, withholding this money if they don't score well in these tests and just and essentially making all about the test. And then they started setting up these arbitrary goals and saying, well, if you don't reach this level, then you're considered a failing school. And we see that we see that in South Carolina where you have these school, quote unquote, report cards that come out and um, giving people like a satisfactory, unsatisfactory, whatever score. So it but it all revolved around or all revolves around uh, standardized testing. So then the schools to survive, the leaders of the school said, well, this is how the game's going to be played. I have to ensure that our test scores go up. So everything became about collecting data, uh, making sure, having benchmarks and goals and, and uh, you know, doing all these and, and increasing the amount of testing to ensure that by the end of the year, our kids are going to be where they need to be on these tests so that we can placate the politicians who forced this crappy system on us, right? And of course, what did this do? Well, this, this created a system where educators were no longer artists but had to paint by numbers because they wanted more and more control over what was going on in the classroom to ensure that the, testing, the test scores would, would increase. And then you have educators who, educators become increasingly frustrated with that, right? Like, I don't want to paint by numbers. I didn't get into education to paint by numbers. I, I got into have a, this, you know, authentic relationship with students and to, um, to help ignite their curiosity and their passion for this particular subject. And I didn't, didn't get into this to simply prepare students for a test. Now, there's nothing wrong with assessment. That's not, that wasn't the issue. But the, the, the problem is that when you, when you make it all about the standardized test, this bubble and test at the end of the year, it kills creativity. It kills the ability to sort of be in the moment 
and to have these uh, teachable moments because you're so fixated on this, um, these deadlines and these benchmarks that you have to be at at, at particular times during the year. And then the students, of course, start to rebel against that, right? Because they don't, they, you know, the learning isn't about like preparing yourself for a bubble and test. Like they, that's not, I mean, the only, the students who, the students who care and understand this is, this is the hurdle I have to get through to get where I want to be in life. They'll do what they need to do. But no, most young people, their passions aren't ignited by preparing for bubble and tests, right? So the whole system was set up that way. And the arbitrary goals, if you go back and look at No Child Left Behind, what the goals were set at each year, they were in, they would get increasingly higher to, to where more and more schools would fail. And then you had race to the top. And everything, again, revolving around standardized tests. And then, and they're still vilifying because not all school, the schools were not, were not always successful in meeting those metrics. Vilifying teachers unions. So you started started to see here in South Carolina and other states an effective campaign against teachers unions and teachers union movement started to decline. People were leaving the union movement. The problem wasn't the union. The problem was the system that was forced upon educators and their students. And it was all to serve the interests of folks who were um, hyper focused on international test score comparisons. So we go back to now as we as we get closer and closer to now, people also wanted to end public schools so that funding can go to private corporations because that's where there's profit to be made there. And so all those influences came together to essentially chip away at public trust in educators, public trust in teachers unions, public trust in public schools. And then you add on to it, add on to that um, now telling the public that educators are grooming your kids. So this idea that somehow they're pedophiles, that they are indoctrinating your kids with Marxism that they're teaching critical race theory. So there's all of that going on and, and the public, not all of the public knows better. So they just believe what they hear in the news and from these political pundits. Let's, let's, um, and so anyway, so that's chipped away. And now, of course, they come in with the, so the answer is send your kids to a private school. And we're going to give you a $6,000 coupon to do that, right? And we're going to take it out of public tax dollars. And we're going to censor the the schools and, you know, we're not going to necessarily pay teachers any better or give them better working conditions. And we'll just watch the public. We'll watch as we do this, we'll watch the public school system implode. And then naturally the answer will be to privatize the whole thing. Right. And then eventually late stage is they'll get rid of the vouchers. Or they'll just increase the tuition, right? So I can have a six thousand dollar voucher, right? But then what happens to tuition rates? It's a law of supply and demand. A private, a private entity. All think about Barnes and Noble. If everybody in in the county got a fifty dollar gift card to Barnes and Noble, what are they going to do to the price of books? Are they going to stay the same? Probably not. They're probably going to raise the 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 price of books because now everybody's going in there and has fifty dollars to spend. So private schools can raise their tuitions and then folks are left out of, out of luck, right? So Keneal says, I imagine an edu educator world where all educators get to eat lunch away from student responsibilities like opening milk packages, condiments, and <laughs> managing student behavior, behavior while trying to eat in a 10-minute window. Absolutely. Um, you know, Keneal and, and several of us on the SCEA staff were have gone around and we've been you know, working at schools, whether it's uh, through recruitment blitzes and things like that, that we've done. And um, we see what's going on. We see these educators and they have no breaks. You know, at lunchtime, they're, they're busy working. They can't, they don't even have time to, to chat. Um, it's crazy. And then Keneal says, I imagine a world where educators can choose where they would like to work up until mid-July of each year. 
and a world where students have teachers who are well rested and ready to ignite their curiosity. Learning should be about inquiry and creativity to problem solve. Absolutely. So we spent the first <laughs> half of tonight um, talking about what's wrong. So let's let's shift gears here for a minute and um, let's let's talk about how do we take our care of ourselves in the midst of all of this. So educators are struggling. I, I see it everywhere. I see educators who psychologically, emotionally are struggling right now. Um, there's so much, so many different pressures. Uh, I've, see, I've heard from educators who uh, are struggling because their rent has gone up four or $500, but their pay hasn't gone up enough to cover that. So they're having to move. Uh, having to find another place to live, and they're having a hard time in this environment finding uh, affordable housing. Um, I've talked to educators that are just stressed out because of the pressures of standardized testing and the pressures that are placed on them from the the censorship. So, like every time they turn around, a book or material that they're use that they used to use um, is is under scrutiny, and they're scared to use it. They're scared to say anything. They're scared. Uh, that they're, the, the history lesson that they're teaching is going to somehow get them in trouble. Um, so teachers are under a lot of stress, um, not, not having a break during the day. Um, a lot of times having to leave the work, their, their job and go work a second job in the evenings or on weekends um, and just exhausted. So how do we take care of ourselves in the midst of that? First of all, um, going back to what I said is joining your union so we can fight for better working conditions and fight uh, to uh, improve your wages and your, um, and the resources that you have and, um, and fight against these uh, folks who are trying to censor and, and, uh, and scare you. So coming together in a union is, is one way to do that. So we can advocate together, and fight together. The other way is to, that's sort of the outside view. There's an inside view as well. So I have to take care of myself on the inside while I'm going through all of this. But we're not going to solve all of these problems, you know, overnight. Uh, it's, it's going to be a, a battle for a, period, a long period of time. And we'll continue to fight. Even if we lose battles, we'll continue to fight uh, together. But we have to find a way to carve out some peace and happiness while we're going through all of this. So when I was teaching, I taught, tell this story, uh, when I was teaching, um, I was in my sixth year of teaching and, uh, I was coaching and I was uh, taking on a lot of different clubs. I was announcing all the home football games, all the home basketball games, um, spending a lot of time after school and, really invested. And, um, and so I was struggling and, uh, and then I found mindfulness meditation and, um, that was a game changer for me because it helped me, um, identify the fact that a lot of the stress I was, uh, experiencing was created by my own thoughts. And so without further ado, I'm going to bring in Gary Weber, who, is here. I hope he's ready. Gary, you ready? Yeah, I'm ready, Todd. All right. How are you doing tonight? A little screwed up at first. My fault. That's okay. I'm glad you finally made it. I want to um, everybody to to uh, to know how excited I am. Uh, Gary is someone that I have uh, watched uh, a bunch of his uh, presentations and lectures online, and uh, this is a copy of his book. It's called Happiness Beyond Thoughts, and we're just actually. It came in at a perfect time because it was just getting to the part where we were, I was talking about how as a teacher, um, I, 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 it took me a while to understand how, how my thoughts were creating a lot of the stress that I was experiencing. And once I was able to undo that for me, it was a, it was a game changer in terms of the, the stress that I was feeling. Can you talk a little bit about that? Like when you do lectures on, you talk about the, you know, the me and the, uh, and you talk about the buckets of thoughts. Can maybe you can help people kind of have a basic understanding of how thoughts generate so much of our stress? Um, 
Well, the biggest problem is we we think there's an I there. Uh, and so what you do is you say, okay, it, what, is there an I there? You look at, I'll give you some of the data here if I get my hands on it. If you look at how many uh, operating things we have going on in our brain at any time. I'm sorry, we're moving the rest of the equipment here. I'm trying to get some more money. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you look at something like free will, for example, right, which is everybody's push button, you look at the possibilities of uh, your being able to project what's going to happen in your life is zero. Um, you look at even trying to go to a lunch with somebody. Um, you go to lunch, you don't go to lunch. And then that it's all kinds of people down the road. You take four people trying to meet for lunch. There's so many things that can happen in any of their lives. It impacts so many people's other lives that you just can't can't manage it. So right. you, you got to eventually come with the idea that with this eye that we have doesn't exist. And you can just watch that over and over again in your own life and see, do I have control? Does Todd Scholl have control over what's going on in his life? And, you know, does it ever... Ever prove out to be true? I mean, do we have any, we have no free will. No. This but is no, no one to have it. So, this is a really, I think, for some pe folks who are, might be watching this and aren't, haven't, haven't kind of taken the first steps into this kind of understanding. Um, I think, like, when, when we say this I doesn't exist, I think people. I can I can imagine some people watching me like I exist like I'm I'm sitting right here like I guess I see my body I see, like I see myself here <laughs> on the screen so help help people understand what you mean when you say I don't exist because I think there's there's going to be a natural sort of uh, resistance to that and 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 talk about it in a way that's that's science scientific and secular um, so that folks can can find it accessible. Some of this gets into quantum mechanics, but, but, but okay. it basically comes out that this one number is um, free will. You're personally cho choosing how to collapse all of those wave functions in your body. There actually are seven times 10 to the 27th. That's seven and then 27 zeros are the possibilities of your being able to collapse all those wave functions at the same time. So, um, if you just watch yourself in a day and just take, just drop back for a second and just stop, just stop like that. That's all you have to do. You talk about in your, your, um, in some of your lectures, you talk about the blah, blah, blah. And your your experience of of sort of being able to disengage with that, and so my question that I have when I when I watch this is, I definitely see that I definitely see the blah 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 like the the inner chatter going on, and you're suggesting you the you've suggested that you've been able to turn that off. Mm -hmm. I can get to a point where like it, when I'm practicing mindfulness, where it feels like that's slowing down a little bit. But then I get back into life and it just it just comes right back. It comes right back online when I get into traffic or, right. you know, I have to have to in, in, engage with folks. So how does how does that how do you navigate life without the blah, 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 but still be able to, you know, navigate traffic and get groceries and stuff? Well, because you find out that eating groceries and navigating traffic, you don't have time to sit around and think of what to do. You're in a busy interstate. As I am often, and you say, "Okay, I'm not going to think about all of this." And you can't think about it. You just got to be there, present, and watching. The guy in that lane, the guy in this lane, the guy in that lane. You don't have to think about that. Your body, mind, whatever you want to use it, something says, "Okay, we're going to either kill Gary today or not." And and 
gets down to that. I, mean, that's, I was in a, in a near miss about a week ago. No more than a second difference. You could go the other way. Right. So you just, you can't even function your daily life if you're sitting there thinking all the time about what you're supposed to be doing and you aren't doing it. Yeah. That help? Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I, and I, your point about free will is something that I've been wanting to talk with about educators um, because um, it's the whole notion of free will is so important when it comes to how we, how we respond to student misbehavior and how we understand student behavior yeah. um, and how we understand our own behavior. Right. And be, and I've actually, I have a, one of my closest friends is a philosophy professor at um, West Virginia university and he, and he's, his expertise is in free will. And we talk about, you know, if, if I'm a teacher and I see my students as having this libertarian notion of free will, then, then, then their misbehavior can can seem more personal and it can make elicit i think a, a much more angrier uh, uh uh infuriated response whereas if you just see it as a set of causes and conditions that led up to that moment that that the student can, can't really do much about then in other words the less you believe in libertarian free will the more you just understand this is just a natural outcome of things happening and yeah. i think it diffuses some of that anger for me it right. does and these bodies are too complicated for us to be able to really step in there and get in the way. There's just too much going on. You just can't. You just can't take the time to do it. Right. I, I don't know how else to say that. I've got I got the whole chapters here in the one book about free will, and it goes over and over. They said that again. You just don't have enough processors in your brain to manage all of this stuff if you believe you're in control of it. You just can't be in control of it. And you think that's kind of like one of the things that causes so much human misery is that we, underneath it all, we realize we don't have control and somehow we're trying to grasp for it and, yeah, and, sure. and never can have it. You never can have total control. And that just creates so much anxiety and, and really depression. Ultimately, we're so, we're so um, just wiped out trying to c c manage and control our ex everything. And then right. when we realize we can't, it's there's this feeling of despair. That's right. But they, this, this loop goes round and round, and you you got to somehow get to the point to where you can say, like we just did, you know, just stop for a second and see if you can control what's going on in your in your mind right now. Yeah. I mean, it, it, you've seen self inquiry. You know all about that. And there's a big self inquiry thing. A lot of my stuff's about self inquiry, and and I was is as uh, psychotic as anybody else. Uh, and it really got to be the point where this is this is really as crazy. This, this can't go on. And so I started being wondering, scientifically as well as personally, you know, what's what's the problem here? And I right. found out, well, this is, I has this problem. Yeah. And you think, okay, what am I, where am I, who am I, when am I, what is this? You just keep asking that. If you just do that for yourself in the day, so you like take 25 minutes, 30 minutes, and just ask yourself, say, and Todd will say this, Todd may say, where am I? And so Todd asks himself, where am I? For 25 minutes, 30 minutes, of course, per day. And then maybe three or four times during the course of the day, you come back to the same question again and say, where is Todd now? You can do it right now. Where is Todd? You try to find Todd. Right. You can't find Todd. That's right. And that's it's, a, subjective, it's a subjective sense of self that's constantly changing. So there's absolutely. nothing to grasp onto. Yeah. And yeah. You've got so much, especially in today's world, so many confusing uh, interfaces. Right. You look at the politics, look at the, you just name it. Everything right now seems to be a mess. And I think the only way to get out of that mess is to say, well, Let's find out who's causing all these problems. And you say, okay, I'm causing all these problems for myself. Because I believe I can control them, and I obviously can't. So you get deeply frustrated. And so I just said, this is crazy. I just started doing self-inquiry. 
So one of the things that I like about your lectures is that you tie in brain science. And I think that's something that in, in the field of education that we too often overlook. Um, and it's one of the things that as I developed the Center for Educator Wellness and Learning, one of the primary things I want to promote is a real deep understanding of, of neuroscience and understanding how the brain works. When, you've, when you talk about how um, under, under this sort of non-dual mindset or this, you know, that can be achieved, I guess, through different modalities, but meditation is one of them, mm -hmm. um, you, see, you see changes in the brain. Can you kind of give a basic primer to folks watching about what happens in the brain when, we, when we're able to let go of that, that small I sense of, or small S sense of self? How many other ways to say it? Um, okay, here's, a, here's one. Uh, now, when I, was, I live in a college town. You watch the college kids will go around. I'm not picking on college kids, but it's this. It's this. It never stops. It just never stops. And so, you know, they're, what they're trying to do is somehow get control of the world through the information they've got on their machine. And it doesn't work because you, they're constantly just wrapped up doing this. I've seen people in meetings with other people, meetings that they really mean to be attending, attending it, for example. Say you're having dinner with somebody, it's two people, three people, four people. And, you know, they're all doing this, they're all doing this. And they're not listening to anybody. No one's paying attention to anybody because they think the next person on the year is going to be more important than the person across the table from me. Right. And I think, you know, this has been a tremendous boon and uh, problem for us. If you go back 15 years, we didn't have these things. Life was simpler. Life went a different way. But now, I, I, this, is, this is becoming how we do things. And um, what can I say? What happens, what happens in the brain when you're able to let go of the sense of I, like I know, I know a little bit about the default mode network. I know a little bit about like the prefrontal cortex and, yeah. and some of the, the changes in the amygdala if you practice right. long enough. But what are, what are some other sort of like the sense of self is our sense of self is kind of located in a particular region of the brain, if I'm understand correctly. Is it is that correct? It's all over the place. It's all over the place. Okay, yeah. so it's it's not it, it's not one specific place that's responsible. Well, how many how many toys are there? <laughs> no, I'm serious. I'm serious. You know how many Todds are there? A lot of Todds. You know, a lot of Todds. A lot of Todds. So okay, now what? How many Todds do I need? You say, you know, all the Todds. Can they all the Todds do something at the same time? No, no. because this Todd wants to do this, and this Todd wants to do that, and sometimes the, the constant Todds are arguing all day long. And so you got to say, okay, I've got to get Todd out of the equation here somehow. It's just, you know, it's just pretty simple logic. You just got to get some way to break this stuff. We, scientifically, you can do it. You saw deep fumble network, all those things. Yes, um, but it really it's an experiential journey. You've got to really want to do this yourself. That little inquiry question I just told you, just do that every day and try it for a week, a month. And if you say, hey, where is Todd? My question for the month is going to be, where is Todd? I'll do that for right. half an hour a day. Blah, blah, blah. And so Todd says, blah, blah, blah. pretty soon you'll start to say, well, where is Todd now? Hmm, Todd's over there. No, Todd's over here. No, there's Todd over there. And eventually you'll start to say, oh, this is where I start to unwind. But you've got to see that unwinding process in your own consciousness. And in fact, you just mindfulness to me is a real problem. I mean, mindfulness. There's somebody being mindful. There's a Todd being mindful. And right. So Todd says, well, I'm up for the mindful today. Not as much as I was yesterday. <laughs> I'll, be more, I'll be more mindful tomorrow. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. And so That's he said, true. okay, now mindfulness, I don't figure it, you know, please don't attack. But that's what happens with mindfulness. I mean, I've done yoga and you know, thousands of hours of Zen, 
uh, to lots of them. And they all worked some way, but didn't come until I said, okay, look, these are interesting technologies. Zen is fantastic. You know, yoga is fantastic. But they don't all come to the end good question at the end. The big question is, okay, who, who's doing all these practices? Who's doing mindfulness? So one of the ways that I've thought about it, and you, please correct me, is that there's this sort of substrate. There's just like just an awareness, mm -hmm. just awareness. And then layered onto the awareness is, is everything that we perceive, all of our sensations, all of our perceptions, all of our thoughts. All of those things are almost like, uh, I think Rupert Spira calls it like movies on the screen. But the, the underlying is just the awareness. And everything that we think about, are, 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 as, as everything I think of as Todd Scholl or as me, I, me, when I think about my hand, the thoughts that I have about me as a father, um, right. as, a, as an educator, all of those things are just ephemeral, fleeting things layered on top of that awareness. Is that? Exactly. exactly. So, it's, get, so, it's just, so, it's a, so it's just, so it's a shit really, when you're saying about like, because that's one of the things that I have had to fight against is in, in my mindfulness practice is thinking, even calling it my mindfulness practice, who's mindfulness practice. Mm -hmm. So it's like, but but what the, the practice helped me do is to sort of see the truth of what I just said, which is that all of the, all of the thoughts and all the things that I've been thinking about as myself are really just, are just things coming into in and out of aware in and out of awareness and that really the the fundamental self is just the awareness this with the, the pure awareness and everything else is just colors temporarily on that canvas is that yeah i spent, spent a lot of time in nature and you watch the sort of squirrels around the house and you say okay is that squirrel thinking about what am I going to do tomorrow afternoon? <laughs> well, what the squirrels say, where can I find a nut right now? I'm hungry right, right now. And right. it's hard to get food. So I'll spend this one, one old female squirrel around the house. She just goes crazy all day long, digging in, in, the, in the marsh and the brushes around, picking the buildings. Just you think, okay, now what's, did she sit around with you? You know, I, I wonder, you know, last Wednesday, I was looking over there. Mm -hmm. She doesn't do that. <laughs> right. She's digging right now, under the mulch, right now, to get at this thing. And she doesn't worry about, he said, well, yeah. So that, do you think that's sort of like a human, in human evolution that we evolved to really pay attention to past, to as a as a mechanism to avoid mistakes that would uh, prevent us from survival, or, or, um, and that we think a lot about the future also to ensure that we don't um, that in the future we're not, we don't that we are able to survive, and that that was a an adaptation of humans and the way our brains work to spend a lot of time in past and future thought. Exactly, and that's what that's what causes all the problems because we don't know if we're going to die tomorrow or. Yesterday, you know, whenever you just don't know, right? I mean, I've got friends like that. Boom, gone. It's like that car accident. And, and what you're like, suggesting is that other animals generally are just so in the moment that they may seem nervous in the moment, but they're but they're not. It's not because they're thinking about the argument they had with the, their fellow squirrel last last Wednesday. <laughs> that's right. Or, or, or the fact that they have a checkup coming up next Thursday. And I'm not That's sure. right. I can see the doctor by 9.30, but yeah, I can't get back to 9.30. I can get to 11.30. Oh. <laughs> they just out there right now, and they don't ask any questions about it. There's none in nature. There's no... Um, Sense of time. Know. Like it's, it's that temporal thing you, that you talk about, too, in your lectures about... How in deep meditation, not only does the self of sense of self start to collapse, but the sense of time starts to collapse, and there's Absolutely. just eternal now. Absolutely. So, and 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 that in that state, we can find a lot of peace because we're not tortured by the past and future, past and future thoughts about things that have happened that we 
are problematic or, or things that can happen in the future that are problematic we're just totally here and time collapses the sense of self collapses and if there's no sense of, there's no self there's no self that has problems right. if there's no time there's no problem in the past there's no problem in the future and right here there's nothing wrong right and this is what i'm trying to teach in a secular and scientific way to to people because to me this is where we can get to psychological wellness like this is where like we can undo so much of the stress we face. But in what I noticed is educators in particular, we're almost trained to look back on what happened during the school day. What went wrong? What do you have going on tomorrow? What are your plans? What's, 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 what are you doing next week? What are you doing, you know, next class? We're always thinking about past and future. We're constantly moving time traveling in, in between those worlds. And there's a very strong sense of self because it's, it's me, my classroom, my students, my uh, my event, the evaluation. But are they? Are they your students? Right. Right. No. Just, 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 are they your students? No. No. They're students. They're going to learn or not learn. They're going to pick up on you or not pick up on you. Uh, you know, we try. A lot of academics they try to do that. You watch them try to try to lead a classroom. A, you know, in a complicated classroom, and you watch the students, and they're just like, whatever. Um, we're, not, we're not catching them. We're not yeah. getting their real attention. And I think you've got to be totally present with yourself so you can be totally present for them. Yeah. You know, Susie starts yelling at John, stop. Just stop. Just say, just stop. Right now, where you are, Susan and John, just stop. Just for 30 seconds. Just chill out for a little bit. And then see what happens. How do you, all right, so what would you recommend in terms of a practice for people who, who want to collapse time and sense of self so that they can experience this? sort of underlying peaceful state. I just gave it to you, you know, 25 minutes a day, 30 minutes a day. Where is Todd? Where is Todd? Where is Todd? Where is Todd? And you'll find out that you find, start picking up on sounds. You say, where's Todd? Todd's over there. It's like, over there. It's over there now. Because the sounds coming from you're saying because the sounds coming from a location, yeah. and, I, and I'm connecting the sound with my sense of self because it's my hearing. I'm hearing it, but I'm hearing a sound that's over there, right? It's come so it's coming from over there. So the consciousness that or the whatever the 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 awareness I'm calling Todd is is attaching itself to a sound that's coming from another location. Automatically, so I'm saying I'm over there. Automatically. And then, and then you start to notice that we do that with everything we see, exactly, and everything we taste, and everything we touch, and everything yeah, that we that taste something. sensations. Five different, different bottles of wine. There's like there's four or five different tastes for this thing. Oh, drink much wine, a little bit. But all those things, beer, pick, pick your choice, pick, pick what you want to pick. But you, you, if you want, just conscious, just that what we just talked about. See, walk into a, a little bar. What goes on in your mind when you walk into a bar? So many things. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah. so, so many things. Right. You're just trying to scope out who's around. My buddy's here. There's a girl over there. What are those guys doing over there? What's happening over there? And you say, oh, okay, just, you know, just still go, go calm. Come into the room and just stand there for a little bit. Just give yourself some chill time. Just be present. Just be present for Todd coming into the bar, wherever it is. Just stand there. Just give yourself some time to look, just look around. Some sounds, people, images, and then start to go move around. And so then, since so is it is it the right way to say this is that I'm trying to unhook the awareness from the contents of awareness. Yes. So that I can experience the awareness and not be and not mistake the contents of awareness as the self. Exactly. 
precisely. Got it. That's it. But that's hard to do because we've been we've spent our entire life life building habits and the conditions to to do the opposite. Believing that's how we can control them. Believing that if we can get enough information up here and get enough data and get enough friends and get enough connections, that's going to impact. We can completely control our life. It's right. Absolutely, it's not true. It's just not, impossible. Can't do it. Right. So it's a letting. It's a surrender. There's a certain amount of surrendering here. A lot of it. So it's all about surrender. Hmm. It's really hard. That's a really hard thing to do because, like, when I think about my kids as an example, like I, you know, love my kid and I mm -hmm. call them my kids. You know, as my role as a father, I think about. I think about them and 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 care about them. It's really hard to unhook in in places, especially where there's strong emotions attached to it, or there's strong relationship there. It's, it's a very difficult thing to step back from and say and 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 call that as some subjective sense of self because it feels like the most real thing in my life. Well, it is. I've, I've got kids and grandkids, and you know, done that whole deal. And you say, okay. I have a different, very different relationship though with each one of them. I mean, it's just, you know, we know each other. Maybe that's, you know, a part of the problem. But we know each other good. And you say, okay, well, what's happening with, you know, Josie today? She's having a bad day. She's her boyfriend killed her or something. I said, what do you do? Well, you be present for them. Yeah. But it's really tough with teens, really tough with teens. Especially teen, teen girls, especially. Yeah. Well, um, so. Strike that last mark. But teen <laughs> girls, it's, the teens in general. Teens, yeah. It's, it's really tough. Yeah. I think that's a good point about um, as a parent in particular, I think there is a inclination to control because you want to you feel this such a strong connection to this being that you want them protected you want them safe you want them to be successful so that's where i think we exert the most control is over situations and relationships where we feel this really strong connection and that can actually be counterproductive because now we're putting our ego's needs onto this other being absolutely and, and we don't do a very good job of that <laughs> you just you just don't right yeah uh, so to me it's you know it's a good lesson for parents to say oh look i've expect i have ex expectations for you that i want to fulfill and you're going to work with me to help me fulfill them for you right and here's what i would do if i were in your situation that's yeah. the one i have to catch myself because yeah. my kids will come to me and they'll come to me with a problem and i think they just want me to listen and like you said just, yeah. just be present with it yeah. Just listen to it. Yeah, just listen. My, my thing is I want to tell them, okay, well, here's what you should do about that. No. And that, that doesn't land well most of the time. And so. Most of the time, all they want is somebody to listen to them. Yeah. yeah. Just listen to them. Yeah. And you'll, you'll, then they eventually they'll get more and more trust in you. Yeah. And so they don't expect, you know, dad's not going to yell at me this time. He said, dad's going to listen to me again. Right. I can go to dad and I can just, just talk to him. Yeah. Not be patronized or anything. Just talk to him. Yeah. Well, Gary, I want to thank you for for your time tonight, and thank you for this book. Um, I have tons of highlights and underlying things in there, and your your lectures. Um, they're they're they've been so helpful for me in understanding. I said that you and Rupert Spira probably are the two people that I've listened to uh, on on YouTube and and you know in different formats that really helped me. Um, get closer to a closer understanding. Then you didn't help me because <laughs> there's no me to help. But but you know what I mean. The, I, I, I do. So yeah. You keep reminding yourself of that. Yeah. 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 So thank you so much for your time tonight, and appreciate um, appreciate all that you've contributed to this um, the subject and and uh, for sharing your thoughts tonight. Okay. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Gary. All right. Take care. Okay.
All right, everybody. Thanks so much again. That's Gary Weber, the author of Happiness Beyond Thought, a book I, I would recommend to you if you're interested in the subjects that we just talked about. I want to remind everybody, uh, if you're interested in joining our uh, union, you can go to the SEA, join the SEA.org, or you can text the word JOIN to 48744. Um, again, if you'd like to voice uh, your concern about the voucher bills, you can go to the SEA.org slash S39. If you're, interested, if you're concerned about the censorship that's been going on in our schools, you can go to the SEA.org slash ProTruth. And of course, you can find this live stream and all of our live streams on uh, at, at cool.us, the Center for Educator Wellness and Learning website. That's cool.us, C-E-W-L dot U-S. And uh, coming up, we are going to preview a few things here. We've got um, on the 15th, I always forget to pull this off, the 15th, um, that's next week. Um, Pete Stone is has organized this incredible panel of speakers. They're going to be talking about celebrating Black History and uh, Month and cultural rel relevancy throughout the year. A lot of great uh, folks on that panel for sure. Uh, we also have coming up on February 24th, um, there is going to be a, an event here in Greenville um, on Friday, the 24th from 6 to 7 o'clock at Local Q. We're going to have a, we're going to do a live streamed uh, panel discussion on teacher retention. So if you're in the upstate and you're going to be here that Friday night, come on out and, and join the Greenville County Education Association and some great panelists, including the GCEA president, Terrell Brown. Uh, on the 21st, we're going to have a live stream session called Properly Fueled. Uh, Stephanie Mah Machasek, I think that's her name, how you say her name? Uh, she's going to be talking about how nutrition's impact on student success. That's the 21st of February from 7 to 8. And then uh, we're going to have a session on protecting trans youth on the 23rd from 7 to 8 with Amy Strong. So lots of good stuff lined up. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight. I want to thank everybody who, um, who chimed in with their comments. Uh, Emily, Kay, Keneal, um, Bessie. Thank you so much for tuning in and um, appreciate uh, Gary Weber being here and sharing his thoughts as well. So you guys have a wonderful night and we'll see you at the, uh, the our next live stream, which will be next Wednesday, February 15th from 7 to 8 o'clock with a really great uh, panel discussion. Until then, have a great weekend.